Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm doing a presentation on mobile app moolah, how criminals make money with for-profit mobile malware. Uh, who we are, I, I work with a team of mobile uh, malware researchers. Uh, we deal with uh, a lot of big companies, a lot of uh, carriers, a lot of manufacturers. And we deal with pretty much every mobile platform there is. You got your Java, you got your Android, you got your Symbian, pretty much all of them. Uh, we work, since we work with a lot of malware, we run into a lot, a lot of different variants. We're currently at about 1,100 plus. Uh, previously, Android used to be somewhere near fourth or fifth or whatnot, but in the last six months, it's picked up and become the third largest, right, just behind mobile Java, Java J2ME, and Symbian. Symbian, which is pretty much a, a end of life uh, operating system, is now being phased out, but they're still quite popular in China. Uh, First off, let's go to a couple of historical uh, for-profit malwares, uh, just a few. Uh, the first one we ever saw really was uh, J2ME Red Browser A. This was just a, uh, it pretended to be a web browser, uh, a mobile, uh, a web browser that operated over SMS. Pretty good idea, you save money, it goes over SMS, you're not paying money for your data charges. Not quite, all it did was send SMS and then to like premium rate numbers. Premium rate numbers which are the ones that you send the SMS to it and they bill you. That's pretty much all it did. This was followed quick, shortly by Wesber. Wesber was a very short, small, um, it didn't even spend half the time that Red Browser did, and it pulled off a, this is the same scam, sending SMS and whatnot. These are like the first two. That's historical. We're looking to look at a lot of uh, newer malware. What, what, they've, what they've done since then, what's improved upon that, and kind of where they come from. Previously, we've talked about uh, R&D, the R&D stage of mobile malware. That's the when people start doing their proof of concepts, your research, you're working on a new platform. And we talked about reuse, where uh, basically script kiddies come out, other people start copying you and start making hundreds and thousands of various, uh, I don't know, copycats. We'll be talking about profiting. How do, how do they actually make the money? Where are they making the profit? Where are they getting the money for everything that they're doing? I mean, more than just doing it for fun, right? Uh, let's look at modern for-profit malware. Geographically, it's kind of interesting to see where the malware is coming from, who's actually making money from it. Uh, we've got pretty much the whole world here. Uh, North America, South America, Africa, don't really count. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Neither does uh, Europe, Western Europe, or Australia. Western Europe was kind of interesting because of the iPhone. There was a, there was a ransom attempt on jailbroken iPhones where this guy wrote a, didn't even write a script. He just went and logged into the local uh, local jailbroken phones in, his, in the Netherlands and put, changed the uh, lock image to a note that says, send this so-and-so, say five, five euros to my account and I'll tell you how to secure your phone. And then the guy in Australia, the, the guy who wrote the IKEA worm, the Rick Rolling worm, that changed your background to, to, to a picture of Rick Astley, that guy released his code and then someone took that code and turned that into, a, attempted to turn that into a banking, banking code where they log into your phone and uh, set up a, a a host file to redirect your traffic to a site in Japan. We can't really attribute that directly to, say, Europe or Australia or wherever, or even North America. I mean, we have a lot of smartphones in North America, we have a lot of smartphones in Europe, but we don't see the same kind of attack patterns. Most of what we see is basically in two areas. Uh, that would be the, roughly the Russian-speaking areas and the uh, areas that speak Chinese. Not quite an exact match, but the difference is in, in the Chinese-speaking areas, uh, it's about double Two to one. And most of them are in, in the Russian speaking areas are Java Trojans. Right? How do, how do you actually profit as a mobile malware distributor or producer or whatnot or writer? A lot of people, what do, what do they do? Uh, they either do, they used to do it all manually, you do it yourself, you write it yourself, you put it out there yourself, you put it on a website yourself. And now there are options where you can produce a product and then sell it again. Just like with the, on the PC with your uh, crime work kits, people are starting to sell. Uh, custom-made jar files, at least in, in uh, Russian-speaking areas, they'll sell you a custom jar that's tied to your, your, your specific uh, service. Apparently because it's very easy to sign up for a premium rate service in Russia. You can do it anonymously even, you can get money even back from that. Basically, you, you sign up for the service anonymously, people will send SMS to there, or you will buy a Trojan from somebody and distribute it on a free download, uh, download site or a free pirated software site. Pretty much as, get it as far as possible as many people as possible and have them run your, your Trojan and sending these, these sign-ups and purchases to your website. And it's basically that simple for distribution. But how do you actually make money? 
there are about four or five ways. Uh, the first one we were talking about that we've seen quite a bit is the premium rate messages. Uh, this could be downloads, it could be ringtones, it could be, what do you call it, uh, data service, subscription services, like, okay, I get the latest weather report, or I don't know if you can charge for that. Somebody making money off of that. It, basically, you'll just sign up to the SMS. That's, that's the easiest way. More advanced, uh, oh no, that's actually the easiest way. <laughs> More advanced technique is some, something like uh, click fraud or, or black hat SEL, where you get the uh, malware to basically send traffic to your website. So you have a nice uh, mobile website or some other kind of site, and, and you're, you're, you're sending new traffic there, either through bookmarks or a program that launches the website automatically, or even pulling off uh, click fraud. So you got ads, and the, the, the malware will send you to that, that website and say, okay, it clicks, sends it clicks to you. Click fraud from a lot of different uh, mobile phones, say a few hundred thousand, different IP addresses, different phones, pretty hard to detect. Right? Uh, another way is just stealing your personally identifiable information. Uh, things like your, your, your uh, phone number, your social security number, stuff that identifies you and your, your, your device identifier, your IMEI or IMZ. The various pieces that then make you useful to marketers, useful to identity theft, uh, that's pretty much another stage. This is usually happens with uh, backdoor Trojans uh, and uh, botnet clients, people who have uh, attacks have established uh, something on your website or I'm sorry, on your device to take over your phone. They take, take commands and they grab information from your phone and send it back to the attacker. And they can either, attacker can either aggregate that and resell that or use it to steal your identity. Uh, the other way, this is a little different one, SMS phishing and injection of SMS. This is a neat technique and we have an example later on about what, the, what this is. Um, you can't really do much in SMS. It's basically just a text message, 140 characters. It's like a Twitter message or something. And there's not a lot you can do. You can't convince someone necessarily that it, it, it's come from your bank or it's come from the IRS or wherever it is. You can't really tell them that unless you do something like injecting fake SMS into the inbox where you, you can craft everything. If you try to send it over the carrier's network, somebody will notice there'll be a few differences. It, it won't just fit somehow. They're, they're traces. If you, on the other hand, if, you're, if you have uh, some way to inject that, your own perfectly crafted SMS message using your bank's phone number or your service number for, for the bank or, or for, for the police or whatever into, into, the, into your inbox, you're going to trust it, right? Because it's the exact same number. It's what you expected. There are no differences, nothing to tell. And this is another way to, to drive, either to uh, just fish you or to drive traffic to your website. And then we got uh, stealing accounts. This is another technique you can use with, with your SMS. Uh, what kind of accounts? We're talking your Skype account, your, your uh, QQQQ is a very uh, popular uh, IM service in China, done by Tencent. Uh, there's, it's not officially legal to, to convert to the virtual money in QQQQ coins, uh, to convert that to actual uh, money, actual currency. But there are services that will do that for you. It'll take your money, uh, it's like a third party service, you go there, you say, okay, I have so much money in this account, let me cash out. Not, not quite legal. And same thing with Skype, you may not be able to cash it out. What you could do is actually resell that account to somebody else. So the concept is you've got, got a phone, you've got a phone with a lot of information, you have a smartphone, it's a computer in your hand, and people are robbing your accounts. It's uh, another way you can do it. Um, I think in Russia also there's a way to cash out bounces on your SIM card in case you're carrying like a 10 bucks on your card. You can uh, go to another service and cash out that amount also. Uh, now let's look at uh, detection and uh, analysis evasion techniques for malware. It's pretty straightforward for, for Trojans and whatnot, <coughs> where a Trojan uh, malware is just trying to say, okay, I'm either a chat client or some pornography or a, uh, what do you call it, uh, a social networking uh, client, so use me. Uh, occasionally also we've seen more advanced malware actually inject into real applications instead of just faking it. They'll, they'll take a real application off, them, off the Android market or some other legitimate market repackage it, I mean, insert their code into it, their own malicious subsection and whatnot, and then repackage it and put it out there. And to various other, which goes back to the distribution point. So you've got malware, you've put it into a new legitimate app, let's get into as many hands as possible. Since it's a legitimate app, you would put that into, a, say, a free, uh, free app download site, a pirate site. Say, okay, here's a new app, new version of uh, ICQ or the new version of the Facebook uh, official client, and it's free. People go and they download it and uh, you end up with infected. Uh, that's, that's one way to get past simple evasions. The more advanced one, once again, was installed. Uh, another simple evasion is uh, basic encryption, uh, or obfuscation, really, for some of them. It's some of Java Trojans, 
the one of them actually takes the, uh, the SMS message and the number that they're a message you're trying to send to, to, to one of the primary numbers, and hides it within a uh, standard Internet Explorer file, some HTML file. I forget what this format is exactly, but it seems like a very old uh, or a very common Internet Explorer file. And it's just hidden within the text. It looks like a tag. You can't really tell. Very simple. The thing is, they're not really trying to avoid detection from everybody, but more so from people who download the, the, uh, the file or the item. Basic, you know, basic coverage. So you don't notice immediately that something's wrong. Uh, the one on the bottom is a simple cipher where it, it's just, it, 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 the code itself just takes a, a few characters from the SMS message, <coughs> converts it into whatever it is. But there are also more advanced methods. Uh, Android Ganymi was another, another Trojan, um, went a backdoor and a bunch of other things. It used uh, DES, a much better algorithm, a much more standard algorithm, compared to, say, hiding it in an HTML file, and encrypts its traffic, encrypts its uh, URL queries, which you can send information back to the attacker, and it encrypts whatever commands it gets back, uh, or decrypts the commands it gets back from the attacker, all via, via DES, which is much better, but the symmetric cipher, except we have the binaries, so we have the key. Not that useful. Just so you could try something like public key, I don't know. Uh, another technique uh, mobile malware uses to hide itself or to reduce security on your, on your, on your uh, machine or your phone actually uh, is to make it easy to install. Uh, on Windows Mobile there was an info jack which to change the registry setting allowed you to install your apps without any kind of prompt. So unsigned apps would be installed ooh, easily. Something more current, more recent <coughs> is uh, Dro Android Droid Dream which included two root vulnerabilities. Root vulnerabilities that were used legitimately to root your phone. If you had a phone, you wanted to get full access to your phone, maybe change out the firmware, change out the operating system, customize it a bit. Perfectly legitimate uses. They took those two, put them into the malware, and decided, okay, we're gonna install into the various parts of the system where you can't get to normally. So they gained root access to files and said, okay, we're gonna move us into there. And that's one way of doing it on, on Android. On iPhone, we have jailbreaking attacks, but we haven't really seen those in the same way as in, in the wild, because not too many people have written, you can't actually get your legitimate software in to look legitimate on a, on a stock iPhone. There's no way to do it because they're locked down. Uh, the only thing we see in the wild, the most recent was, uh, or a very good example is the one from uh, last TourCon in October. Uh, Eric Monty of Trustwave, he, he put off a, pulled off a good demo where he uh, used the, uh, he modified version of the jailbreakme.com uh, exploit removed the warning messages and the informative messages from the, uh, the exploit and, and added some code to basically uh, read the data from, from the, 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 the Square scanner. Uh, the Square scanner is a the little uh, credit card reader that's uh, sold by Square or given away free by Square. Plugs into your, the headphone jack your iPhone. You slide your card through it, just like that. Relatively secure until you get hit by something like this where he uh, uses the exploit, gains access to your phone, jailbreaks it, and copies or executables over to scan your, uh, or scan it in the data that's coming off the card. So he was, he just, the demo was basically, uh, in fact, go to the website, in fact, and then slide the card and see, see the text on screen, the actual credit card as they're read. Just kind of nice. Uh, and let's look at some real examples of for-profit malware. Uh, Java rubbish. Uh, really rubbish, because it's like, uh, they're just really simple programs that send SMS. It takes like people five minutes or two. Very popular in Russia. Apparently, it's so easy to get get a uh, get a premium rate number or, or some kind of service number where you can get paid every time someone someone texts you. That, that they just toss these out like uh, candy almost. You know, it's like so easy to do. And this one is a little a little bit more interesting because it actually customized itself for various uh, countries: uh, Kazakhstan, Ukraine. I mean, they're all 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 different countries, different numbers, and means it's a wider probably a wider gang behind it or a very uh, ambitious uh, attacker. Uh, something more interesting is uh, Vcon Pass A. This was a, uh, a basic a phishing program for uh, one of the more popular social networking sites in Russia, Vcontact. Uh, so it looks like a lot of the mobile app for your program. You log in and your, your details get sent immediately to the attacker. Very nice. So what do you do once you get something like that? How do you make money off of that? Uh, it's a social network. You got their address, you got their, well, maybe not their address, you got their information, you got maybe pictures, you got other blackmailable information. And you can just take that and either use it yourself to blackmail more people or expand your circle of trust or uh, sell to someone else, the reselling technique. Uh, something more interesting is Symbian. Symbian's not too popular in, um, in America so much, but it, is, it was for a time in Europe and in, it is quite, still quite popular in China. And most of the attacks you see on Symbian are coming out of China. This is a slightly older one, uh, Kija. 
It was designed, it was part of a larger multi-dropper uh, malware. It was a collection of malware that did affect your phone. This guy came up with this said, okay, I'm, I have a QQ account, I wanna make some money, let's see, um, why don't I put together some kind of extortion message? Because he's already included all this other malware in that, that package you've installed on there. Your phone's getting slower, it's getting harder to, to use or whatever. This thing pops up occasionally, the message says, hey, you get yourself a, a QQ card for about, a recharge card and for about 50 bucks or whatever the, the currency is, the local, the local currency, and send it to my QQ address so that I can cash out. And then I will send you the fix for your malware or your phone or make your phone happier or easy to use. Uh, we're, uh, we're not really clear if anyone who sent the money actually got their phone fixed, but you know, that's one thing. One way to make money. Uh, another older one is uh, Python uh, Reckloff A. Uh, this, was a, this is a Python script that, um, what does it do? It, just an SMS sending chip. It, it, just to show that yes, that it's not just Java they're using to make really simple SMS sending trojans. People are also using uh, Python. It was a really simple one and it, it sent out a bunch of messages to a premium made number. Very simple. Uh, something more recent is Super Ferry A and B on, on Symbian. This is one of those uh, other attacks where you're trying to generate traffic to a website. It had added bookmarks to your file for, sorry, to your phone, and it had a separate program that launched automatically that, that opened up the, the page of the browser, or, or your browser to the page of the uh, smartphone forum. It was basically just to drive traffic towards uh, the forum, which if you added a few other, other more shiny things to it, like say, I don't know, uh, stealing information or any of the other tools, you'll have a more mm, effective, uh, dangerous tool. This is a little simpler, but it, it shows that they already got the pieces there. You just need to put them together to do something a lot worse, uh, which is followed by something like inspirit.a. Th this claimed to be a patch, but it was really, um, it was really the injecting SMS, uh, fish, injecting a phishing SMS into your inbox uh, malware. The one we actually saw that did this, where it pretends to be something, a real thing, but you don't know what it does. It doesn't actually do what it claims to do, which is like improve your system, it improve your phone, speed it up, whatever. It didn't do any of that. Instead, it put a nice little message from, say, you, if you were a customer of this bank, a message that looks like it came from the server, some of the bank, it says, hey, your, your account's been attacked or hacked or whatever, something along those lines, and if you don't sign into this blah, blah, blah site, you're gonna get uh, disconnected or your money's gonna be locked in. So I mean, it's a, really, a relatively good phishing attempt, and it, you buy it more because it appears much more authentic because it came from your bank. It has your number. It has, there's no way to tell from the message itself that it wasn't an official SMS from your bank. People are actually doing these things. Not theoretical, they're actually doing this. And let's look at uh, Android. It actually has a few more interesting things. There's been in the news. The real quick Android game me, um, it was a bunch of uh, legitimate apps had in code injected into it. Once you get code injected into a live app that does what you want, looks like the real app is attributed somewhere else, and takes more permissions than a regular app. Uh, once again, has a DES to encrypt its uh, command and control commands and to uh, decrypt them, and also to accept uh, data that's sent out via URL query. So it, co it, it, it posts a URL to, or it clicks on URL with the uh, query with the information mirror of your phone, your IMEI, location data, things like that. And it is set to a backdoor on your phone. And how do you make money with something like this? How do you not make money with something like this? Uh, it forwards SMS to, to the command and control server. So instead of uh, like the other SMS sending trojans, this one just takes whatever you're getting and sends it back out. It's a lot like um, another one that that's you, that was used with the Zeus Crimer, Zitmo, which was Zeus in the mobile. That app was trying to uh, basically, that was just a very simple SMS forwarding program. This is that plus more, plus the backdoor, plus a few other things. And it's all on Android instead of say Symbian. I mean, so you would be forwarding your, uh, your account activation number or other details and any private data you thought you were getting over SMS, not anymore. And then what else have we got there? And you got access to your contacts, so you get more targets. Not necessarily, but I mean, it was, it was interesting. It's one of the more complicated ones. Uh, steamy screen, uh, well, it was a Steamy Screen app. I forget exactly how to pronounce this. Uh, Steamy Screen, <laughs> dot A. Uh, so it's like a, sh it's one of those uh, apps where it's like, oh, you can draw on a, on a, a Steamy shower door. Very nice, a legitimate app out there and whatnot, but uh, instead the, uh, the attackers had added code to, to take more information from you, like your IMEI, your phone information, a bunch of things. Uh, it basically, it's a lot like Ganymede. Uh, only different thing was instead of, uh, Forwarding your SMS to the team, whatever SMS you came in, it did the same thing as like those SMS sending to virgins you see now that are coming out of Russia. It was sending, signing up to a number of uh, service providers who would get you money coming out of your, what do you call it? 
like the uh, weather or what any of these data services or, or download services or ringtone services. And also at the same time, it was deleting the messages so you don't actually see the confirmation, which is doubly useful. You don't see the confirmation for, for the service and like, oh, okay, I didn't sign up for anything. You won't know until the end of the month maybe, depending. Or if you have like a prepaid account, when your account runs out, you think, oh, well, I just must have called a lot. Uh, something similar, something newer. This is uh, Jim Sonas. Okay, another one. I forget what the other people call it, P-Zones or something. Uh, this pretended to be a calendar app. It was a pretty good calendar, except every time you open, I think it opened up to January 1st. I mean, not that useful, right? <laughs> you can only see January every time, no matter what year it is, what day it is. Uh, but this did the same thing as the previous apps in, in, in the sending, signing up the services, the premium rate service where you make the money. I mean, this is where the profit comes in for them. Uh, you, uh, actually, uh, somebody described it to me as, um, in China specifically, we have, a, say, a million uh, mobile phone users. If you, if you steal even one uh, one, that's a local currency, one one from a million of users, that's a million one right there. That's a good, good amount of money. I mean, I think it's about six to one, seven to one to the US dollar, but I mean, still, there's a good amount of money from a lot of different users. So it's uh, steal a little from a lot. That's the concept. And then uh, this one is TCET A. This, this is named after what it goes after, which is basically Tencent QQ service. Uh, the concept was it does the same thing and signs up again and it also deletes the message. It was a very simple one, but the nice thing what it did was also went after the local uh, Chinese, a very popular Chinese antivirus program. It said, okay, we're gonna uninstall you too. So it was actually trying to use a little more advanced technique and say, okay, we're gonna get rid of you while we're doing the rest of our crime. They know you're there. They know what, what the name of your package is. It's over on Android and it just tried to install, uninstall it. And if we, I suppose if uh, we're bigger there or whatnot, or if somebody else is bigger there or any of our competitors, we'd be on the list too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another one, cruisewind.a. <coughs> Very similar, same concept. Just sent out SMS messages. Same deal. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, there's not a lot of difference here, except it's also trying to delete a few more things. I forget exactly what program it's trying to delete, but it's going after, oh, I'm sorry. This is, this is what it was actually. Uh, because it's uh, Symbian malware, mobile malware like uh, InSpirit or, or, or uh, Super Fairy, th those were the more popular ones in the last few years in, in China because they were more advanced, you could do more things you could do in Java, you had more access to the phone, you had more access to the native services. Uh, they used to make a lot more, more uh, botnets and, and botnet clients and more and more complex malware for Symbian. This one is it also attempts to delete Symbian software using a Symbian technique like an identifier for Symbian. It, which implies to us is that uh, they had the code lying around on for the Symbian client or the Symbian malware, and they decided to port it to Android because, hey, Android's hot, there are more Android phones out there, and it does almost everything except nothing because it can't delete Symbian software. There's no Symbian on the phone, it's Android. It, it, it's more of a sign of what's uh, yet to come or upcoming than what is actually going on. All right, and uh, then there's one, I got one more actual real, real malware, or it's more of a proof of concept than an actual uh, for profit malware, but it's very interesting. Uh, this is the, uh, you might have heard about this one. Uh, it was originally called Soundminer, but due to, uh, I think, trademark issue, they had to change it to Soundcomer. Um, yeah, so it, it's basically two Android apps that require very few permissions on your phone. Uh, one is the Soundcomer app itself, and one is the Deliverer app. It's a two-part uh, malware. Uh, Soundcomer, I think it requires just enough to be able to use the microphone and to, to I guess, record that or control it. And deliver only needs internet access. So they communicate, and they can just communicate with each other on device. Very nice, very few permissions. I think there's an actual video for this. I'll have to link in the references. Uh, the actual video for Soundcomer, or you could search on YouTube for Soundcomer. It'll be the first hit, pretty much. Um, is essentially, you install the app, and then they're, they're trying to say there are so few permissions. If you bought a, the, another app that, that's an alarm clock app, it uses about four to five more permissions, hardware control, a bunch more permissions than these. Uh, the key thing with this is that Soundcomer uh, is designed to listen to your, to your audio and convert the audio to, like, uh, to, to actual text. So if, you, if you're, the, the, the use case is if you're using it on a, uh, an interactive voice response, you know, with those uh, press one to go to here or press two for this or press zero for an operator type services. Where, so if you call up your credit card company and you hit your numbers and then it says, okay, enter your credit card number, you, you have two choices. You can either uh, use the keypad to, to have some privacy or you can speak the numbers. What they've done, the team behind Soundcomer, um, they're linked in the references, 
they, they put together a database of, of some of the more common, uh, not a very large one, but this is just a proof of concept, of, of say two or three various credit card services. And they say, okay, this is how their, their uh, automated system works. This is the, the, the entire layout and the flowchart, like you might have seen on some of those websites that let you uh, decide, okay, how do I get to an operator? I forget what those are called. <laughs> But uh, in the same way, they map that out. They've, they've got a, a database to identify what that is and how to, how to get in there and say, okay, this is the spot where, where a user or, or the customer would be calling in, would be dialing up and saying, okay, I'm going to, uh, so you're gonna say your number now. And they know at this rough point, after we've heard all the automated prompts, this is where the real number is. They'll just grab a little segment of audio and then can, can process that on disk. It, it's just sort of a small amount of audio, maybe 15 seconds of audio. Uh, the sound camera grabs the audio, process it with the algorithm, and comes out with the actual, what is it, 60 numbers in an average credit card, unless you have like an American Express or something, it's 60 numbers, converts that to, an, uh, to text, and then transfers those digits only, not the audio file, not the processing, none of that, to the deliverer app. And the deliverer app will then send that over the internet to the attacker, 16 bytes. The nice thing with this is, uh, how did they make money with this? I mean, how would you make money? Once I, again, I mentioned the there, you can either, when you call up your, your credit card company, you either do the type in the digits or you do the, say, the individual digits. I mean, they have a nice demo where you, you, <laughs> you, you say the words, uh, you, you start going like four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever, and it takes it, to, it grabs the sound, processes it, converts the digits, and then sends it over. I think the whole thing for both uh, the touchstones and for the voice took about 15 seconds each, roughly, in that range. And, this is really one of the more and more advanced for-profit type approaches. We haven't seen anyone trying this yet, except in, uh, in research, in academia even. I mean, no one has actually tried to produce a, a Trojan. It's very surreptitious, doesn't use a lot of permission, doesn't use a lot of, uh, much of anything really, and, and takes, your, takes the data and, and exfiltrates it very, very surreptitiously. I mean, what was it, like 16 digits in a little bit of time, a little bit of power, processing power, or oh, more processing power, but I mean, in a very little time, it gets you out there. You, this is more and more of a current for-profit thing. Any of you have actual references here? Uh, does anyone have any questions? Sorry, <laughs> she had the slides. Nope. you expect to see, mm -hmm. um, you know, as things start to advance with uh, mobile malware, like as you're starting to see like mobile malware, bot, like you're starting to see like mobile botnets. Yeah. Things like that. What do you what do you see in, in your research as sort of like the next big thing from the attacker perspective? From the attacker perspective, I kind of like the what with the uh, the Chinese uh, region, where in China and spelled uh, various Chinese speaking areas. Uh, they were moving towards Symbian. They were making much more advanced of uh, botnets and whatnot. Uh, Ganymede is an example of one. Uh, then there's Droid Dream. There's a few others that, that do a lot of work over over the in the app. I mean, they're actually putting all the effort into the app. They're saying, okay, this, this app is going to do something for me. And they're also going after other apps. I mean, it's completely different what they were doing on Java. It's not just a Trojan. It's not just this. They're actually trying to take over your phone entirely. Get as close as possible to you. Get as much control. If you've got a root exploit, they're going to go after that. They've done that already. I mean, they're doing that currently. It's not that we're going to be seeing it. I'd like to see this, someone do something like Soundcom, which is fascinating. But I'm not really seeing something. I don't think that is, uh, here's the thing, if you're making money doing it already, they're not going to go any further than that. I mean, so with, the, with the, like at the uh, Russian speaking areas, they haven't gone any further because they haven't needed to go any further. They've got, they're sticking to really simple Java Trojans because that works. You know what I mean? But China, it's a little more competitive. It is uh, millions of users. You want to look like it's normal. I, I think someone told me, um, it's actually in my acknowledgments, uh, a Fyodor Bohm, and um, he actually sent me the links to, to direction of what's actually going on in mobile crime. Most of what we see is uh, the malware itself, not so much the people actually making money off of this. So I had to ask a lot of different people, like, such as uh, Billy Lee and then Tom Panpan Pan from <coughs> anti White Labs. They, they knew the Chinese market a bit more, and they were telling me that, that it really is a steal a little from a lot, you know, from a lot of people. I mean, that's really where they're going. They don't really, they just need to hide long enough to get your stuff. And then there. I mean, they don't, they're not worried too much about, okay, are you gonna spend a lot of effort on this? Well, what's our payoff? I mean, I, I mean, it's more for them, what is our payoff against our other people? How do I protect myself? I mean, that's why we're seeing the people using DES to protect their, their, their um, just their, the, the CNC traffic. I mean, 
on, on Windows or whatnot, we're seeing uh, botnets and just using plain unencrypted IRC traffic, right? No one cares if it cares if it cares about it at all. But on Android, you've got to worry about the competitors too. Someone will take over your botnet. I think I was at, uh, was it Schmookon? I mean, there was that uh, the demonstration Android botnet from a researcher. Uh, she went to her hackerspace to show off uh, or test her botnet, and uh, this was before she actually presented it, and, and her, her uh, colleagues uh, took over her botnet, hijacked her botnet. Then she added encryption, I mean. <laughs> but I mean, they, they get you. If, 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 you're not, if you're in a competitive environment, like apparently the Chinese market is, you add these other features first because other people are coming after you. Much like the uninstalling of the antivirus, uh, that's the next step. I mean, we saw that in, uh, initially in Symbian like four years ago. Yet yeah, nobody did that in an actual profit-making area. No one actually went into it. No one was making it. That was just uh, actual proof of concept malware. It wasn't someone saying, okay, hey, I've got all this stuff here, and how do I, how do I keep my competitors out? How do I take over? That's happening in the Chinese market right now, and it's actually looking really interesting. It is a large sector. It's got a lot of people, a lot of users, a lot of people involved, and that's where I think we will see a lot more of these uh, issues coming up and a lot more interest, actually. I mean, it's no longer just the uh, proof of concept we're looking at, real malware, a lot more entertaining. Uh, does anyone have any more questions? Oh, please. WebOS, um, truthfully, all we have seen, are, once again, other security researchers saying, okay, we've gone after the WebOS, we, we like the concept of, hey, it's Linux, but it's a web operating system running on top of Linux, and their exploits, like, I think it was, uh, I forget what they were, access, uh, various access uh, exploits, uh, I think, I'm not sure if somebody had root exploits on it, I mean, you've got Linux, it, it, it's much the same as on Android, where you can still attack the uh, platform, and you can still go out to but we haven't seen anyone maliciously do it. I think part of it is because they don't have as much of the market. I mean, you've, you've seen the original uh, thing in the, my pie chart there. It, it, most of what we've seen has been on the larger distribution. Android is benefiting from that because they're pretty much giving, Google's giving away the software to the manufacturers. So it's almost on everything. So I mean, it's slowly, slowly taking over a lot of things. Uh, Symbian, not so much because there aren't, Symbian has now become um, abandoned almost. I think there are now Nokia's moving over to the largest pretty much largest uh, user of Symbian outside of Asia was uh, Nokia, and they're moving to Windows Mobile. So, I mean, we're not gonna see the same kind of interest in the Nokia. Uh, we haven't seen any real interest in Nokia out, out there, in, in Nokia smartphones in a while. No one's actually going after them in Europe. It was kind of what my sort of semi-broken picture back there was, was that no one's actually looking in those areas, possibly because there's so many ways to make money on legitimate apps. I mean, fewer people are looking, so they're what the key is. Yeah, uh, yeah. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. Back there. Yeah. Do you have an Android phone? Like, how do you protect yourself? In what sense? What do you want to know how to protect yourself on an Android phone? Well, if you download like, <coughs> one of those uh, shower. Okay, okay. So, if, if, how do you protect yourself from downloading something bad? That, that's also that's part of the thing. Uh, I guess a reputational kind of thing. If it comes from the Android market. Uh, We've had very few problems with the Android market. And, I mean, actual malware on the Android market, I think, um, often I can't think of anything deliberately malicious that's been really big on the Android market that has lasted longer than like a day. I mean, I mean, they get something bad, it, it looks bad, and almost immediately someone says this is bad. I think the last one was, um, it slips my mind at the moment, but it, it was uh, posted on Reddit about, uh, it might have been, I think it was actually Droid Dream was, was one of the ones that was on the Android market and they pulled a whole bunch of apps in like a day or, no, sorry, a week after it was noticed. Uh, essentially, you, you want to go after, uh, you want to download apps that have good reputations, have been around for a while. It's sort of <laughs> like allowing someone else to take the hit for you by saying, okay, let's let the first um, people who are out there try it first and then see what happens. Kind of what you do to, to protect yourself on Android. I mean, you wouldn't necessarily say, okay, uh, oh, also don't go to the free download sites <laughs> or the, uh, I'm sorry, the pirate sites actually. You avoid pirated software. I mean, I mean that's one way of doing it, definitely. Um, there's not a lot you can really do to really, that'll put you in danger other than going to off the Android market. I mean, there's enough uh, coverage and, oh, sorry. Um, something mm -hmm. I've been doing recently no, is please. looking at what permissions the app is asking for mm -hmm. versus what the app is. So if the app you're downloading is, say, Angry Birds, right, and look at the permissions it's asking for, if it's asking for more permissions than the type of app should, that can be that, that's very useful to look at that, actually check out to see if the permissions suit the app itself. 
Now that's the reason why that combo one works out great because it it's perfect. Yeah. The, also, the other problem is sometimes we go uh, because there's so many permissions. We see them all the time. We go blind and we see okay. We ignore what they say, what it says. If it has enough permissions and looks about right, you're just gonna say, "Hey, everyone else has downloaded it. Why don't I do?" It really comes back to that reputational thing again, where if enough people have had it and for an, it hasn't been a problem, then that's probably where you want to go. And, but yeah, I mean, people are definitely looking at permissions. I think a few other uh, companies are looking at it also to see, okay, how are the permissions matching against it? Are they dangerous? What do we have to worry about? And this is definitely a better way of doing it. But it's that, that whole part where if you have to do it yourself, it's a little, little too much to work for, for most people because there are just so many words there. I mean, I, I have to deal with this all the time, and I, even I start not paying attention if the reputation's good enough. But then again, if I catch something, I, that's my job. I go look at it. <laughs> it's not really my personal phone, so. Wouldn't recommend for everyone that. Uh, does anyone have any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.